In this chapter, chapter 11, we're going to be discussing two different populations and comparing two different populations and whether they have similar or not similar characteristics. In the previous two chapters, we discussed inferences regarding a single population parameter, but now we're going to modify these slightly so that we can compare two population parameters. In the first section, we're going to talk about how to correlate two different population proportions. A sampling method is called independent when the individuals selected for one sample do not dictate which individuals are to be selected in the second sample. A sampling method is dependent when the individuals selected to be in one sample are used to determine the individuals that will be selected in the second sample. Dependent samples are often called matched pairs samples. It is possible for an individuals to be matched against themselves. For example, your weight before and after a diet would be matched pairs. We would compare your weight before with your weight after a diet. It wouldn't make sense to compare your weight before a diet with Joe's weight after the diet. Proportions of two independent samples, we're going to first discuss hypothesis testing. To test hypotheses regarding two population proportions, P1 and P2, we can use the steps that follow provided that the samples are independently obtained through a randomized experiment NP1 minus P is greater than 10 for both the first sample and the second sample. This is the only way to determine that the distribution is normal. Also, both samples from your first and your second group have to be less than 5% of the total population of which they're each coming from. This requirement ensures that the independence is necessary for a binomial experiment. Let's recall for hypothesis testing the basic steps. First, determine if the above requirements have been met. Then determine the null and the alternate hypotheses. Your null and your alternate hypotheses will look like one of these below. You're going to have a two-tailed test, a left-tailed test, or a right-tailed test. You'll then select your level of significance, which is typically given, and then you'll compute your test statistic. So you'll notice down here that you have your p hat 1, which is going to be your sample proportion from your first sample. p hat 2 will be your sample proportion from your second sample. And then you're going to notice that there's a p hat with no subscript and no number. This is the average of both of these p hats. In other words, you take your x over your n plus your second x over your n and you add them together and find the average or exactly halfway in between those as long as the samples are the same size. We can also use StatCrunch to determine this test statistic by going to Stat Proportion Stats and using the two sample approach which I will show you after the next example. Then we go to table five to determine the p-value by looking up this z-test statistic in the table five. And if the p-value is less than your level of significance, we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we fail to reject and then we state our conclusion. So on the next page, we're gonna run through an example using all seven steps. In this example, <clears throat> we have the drug Prevnar, which is a vaccine that is meant to prevent certain types of bacterial meningitis. It is typically administered to infants starting around two months of age. In randomized double-blind clinical trials of Prevnar, infants were randomly divided into two groups. Subjects in the first group received the Prevnar, while subjects in the second group received a control vaccine. After the first dose, 107 of the 710 subjects in experimental group 1 experienced a fever as a side effect. 
after the first dose, 67 of the 611 of the subjects in the second control group uh, experienced a fever as a side effect. Does the evidence suggest that a higher proportion of subjects in group 1 experienced a fever as a side effect than the subjects in group 2 at the 0.05 level of significance? Let's use the seven step format to test the hypothesis and then we'll check it with StatCrunch. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to meet our requirements. The requirements that have to be met is that this, both samples have to come from a simple random sample. So up here when we discussed both of our uh, groups, the subjects, uh, we have to decide whether they were come from a random sample. And it states right here that all of the subjects came from a random sample. We also have to determine that they are independent. In order to be independent, both uh, the N1, which is 710, has to be less than 5% of all infants of two months of age. Clearly, 710 is less than 5% of all infants. Also, 611, which is the small n, has to be less than 5%, again, of the total population. And obviously, uh, 611 clearly is less than 5% of all infants. Also, we have to determine that the distribution came, came from a normal distribution. So we have to uh, decide whether the first sample first came from a normal distribution by multiplying n1 times p hat 1 times 1 minus p hat of 1 and make sure that is greater than or equal to 10. Well, n1 of the experimental group, there were 710 subjects in my sample. p1 hat is 107 out of the 710, which is given to us here. 1 minus p1 hat, and when I put that into my calculator, that is indeed greater than or equal to 10. So the first sample does indeed come from a normal distribution. We also have to check the second sample. So we're going to do the same thing with the information from my second sample. The size of my second sample was 611. P hat from my second sample is 67 out of 611, which is given to us right here, and 1 minus our P hat. And when I put that into my calculator, that is indeed greater than or equal to 10. So we have indeed proved that both samples come from a normal distribution. So now we can proceed with the hypothesis test. The second step is to decide what our null and our alternate hypotheses are going to be. Our null hypothesis is that the two populations from the, po the proportions from each of the populations are equal to each other. In other words, those that experience a fever as a side effect of those that take Prevnar is equal to those that don't. Our alternate, we're going to say, is that the Prevnar experiences more fevers than those that don't. You can also write these a different way. If you decide to put P2 over on the left hand side, you could say P1 minus P2 is 0, or the alternate P1 minus P2 is greater than 0. So that's another way of writing your null and your alternate hypotheses. Our level of significance was stated as 0.05. So now we have to put together our test statistic. Z, by definition, is equal to, let me write out the equation, which is on your cheat sheet, but I will write it out here for you. P1 hat minus P2 hat over the square root of P hat without a subscript, 1 minus P hat times the square root of 
1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So let's put all of the information together. P1 hat was uh, 107 out of 710 minus P2 hat, which was 67 out of 611. I like to use the whole fractions in the equation. If you do this in your calculator and then you put in a rounded decimal right here, your answer might be too far rounded off and my math lab might not take that answer. So I like to put the whole fractions in there and calculate this as one big calculation without any rounding errors. All right, so now p hat without the subscript means we're going to add these two together and find the average of the two. So we're going to add together 107 plus 67 over 710 plus 611. That's p. Then we're going to multiply that by 1 minus the, that p hat. So now we keep going. Now we multiply that by the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So it's quite a large equation. If you break it down into parts, that is perfectly fine. Just be careful with rounding your answers. When you put all of this into your calculator, you're going to get a z-score that is equal to 2.20. Step five is now to find the p-value. So we go to table five and we look up the p-value that is associated with that particular z of 2.20. And when you go to table five, which is your z-table, and we look up a 2.20 of a p, you find that the p-value is 0.9861, which is the left-hand side. But remember, this was a right-tailed test. Remember, our alternate shows that this is a right-tailed test. So if we were looking at a graph of this, we're talking about just the right tail, and we're looking for that p-value inside that right tail. So in order to find the p-value, we have to subtract the value that we found in the table from 1. So our p-value is 0 0.0139. That's the area that's in that shaded area of the curve. Then we compare the p-value to alpha. The p-value is 0 0.0139 and alpha is 0.05. Alpha is greater than p-value or p-value is less than alpha. When that is true, we will reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we had enough evidence to make this sample so unique that it was so far away from the average that it was considered unique enough, strange enough, that this null hypothesis is no longer true. We can now state this in its place. So in conclusion, we would say we have sufficient evidence then we state the level of significance because if you didn't, our answer would be different depending on our level of significance. For example, if our level of significance, if we used only 0.01, well then our p-value would be greater than our alpha and we would fail to reject. So you always want to make sure you state your level of significance in your conclusion.
So now we state what we're concluding, and we always conclude the alternate, which was that those that use Prevnar experience a fever at a higher rate than those that don't. So we will conclude that a higher proportion of subjects taking Prevnar experienced a fever than in the control group. Okay, so we've done a hypothesis test of two different proportions of two different populations. Let's now look at a confidence interval. A confidence interval of two different population proportions. Um, again, these are independent samples. We have to, again, make sure the three characteristics or requirements have been met. And then this is the definition of the lower and the upper bound for the confidence interval. Of course, we can also do this in StackCrunch. So when I'm done with this example, I will uh, do this confidence interval and I'll go back to the previous problem and I'll do that one as well. So we've got an example here. I'll leave those formulas there at the top because we'll need those. It says the Harris Poll conducted a survey in which they asked how many tattoos do you currently have on your body? Of the 1,205 males that were surveyed, 181 responded that they had at least one tattoo. Of the 1,097 females surveyed, 143 responded that they had at least one tattoo. So let's construct a 95% confidence interval to judge whether the proportion of males that have at least one tattoo differs significantly from the proportion of females that have at least one tattoo, and then we'll interpret this interval. So the lower and the upper bound have the exact same equation. The only difference is a minus and a plus sign. So I'm going to write it one time. P hat from my first sample. We'll call uh, my first sample group one. We'll call those the males. And we'll call group two the females, just so I can uh, remember which group is which. So P one hat is going to be the proportion of males. In this case, uh, there were 181 out of 1,205 men that have at least one tattoo. Minus P2. So this is the females, 143 of 1,097. Then we have plus and minus. So plus would be the upper bound, minus would be the lower bound. Then we're gonna need our Z of our alpha over two. Well, remember uh, our alpha in this case, we're using a 95% confidence interval. That means my alpha is 0.05. Those are gonna add up to 100%. So if you go to your table five again, you're gonna find in the lower left-hand corner, you're gonna find all your Z values that you would use for these confidence intervals. So in table five down here, for a 95% confidence interval, your Z of alpha over two, because remember we're splitting that into two corners, it's a two-tailed, is going to be 1.96. So we're gonna put 1.96 in here for z times the square root of p1 hat, which is our male, so it's 181 over 1205, uh, times 1 minus that same value over n1, which was 1205. And then we add that to the same thing for females. So it's gonna be P2 hat, which is 143 over 10 
97 times 1 minus that value all over N2, which is the size of the sample of females. So you're going to put all of that into your calculator. And if you recall the different parts, this is what we use as our point estimate. And uh, let me use a different color. This is your standard error. And uh, this is your level of confidence right here. And this whole thing is your margin of error. Okay. All right, so when I put that into my calculator, I'm going to get a lower bound of negative 0 0.009 and an upper bound of 0 0.048. Obviously, this is a good time to practice that, so pause the video and make sure you're getting the same answers that I did. So in conclusion, we are, and this is where you state your confidence. Remember, we're 95% confident. That the difference in proportion of males and females that have at least one tattoo is between negative point zero zero nine to point zero Four, eight. Also, I'd like to point out that since the interval contains both a negative and a positive value, we cannot conclude there is a significant difference. In other words, the difference between men and women could be negative, the difference can be positive, which states that neither one of them is guaranteed to be larger than the other because the difference can be one of either sign. So we cannot conclude that there is a significant difference in the proportion of female and male tattoos. So theoretically, we actually did a hypothesis test as well. Since we have one of each, we would obviously fail to reject that they are the same. Now I'm going to switch over to StatCrunch. Okay, so I'm over on StatCrunch now, and I'm going to go back to that Prevnar example uh, where we did the hypothesis test. And so we're going to go down again to proportion stats, just like we did uh, with one sample, except for we're going to select two sample instead. We have the summary of the data because we don't have all the individual data points. We just have a summary of the data. So our sample one for this was, was the Prevnar experimental users. And we had, for the first group, we had 107 out of 711 that experienced a fever of the Prevnar users. And the second group was the control group. And of the control group, there was 67 out of 611. Actually, this was 710. So 107 out of 710 Prevnar users and 67 out of 611 in the control group. And then we conducted a hypothesis test. We were conducting whether there was a difference between the two proportions. And you can state that there's a difference of something that's uh, of, of value, like maybe there's always a difference of 5 or, or 0.055%. Um, but we're just stating that there is no difference. In other words, they're the same or not the same. So I'm not going to change that. Um, and then we also, in our alternate, we decided that we thought Prevnar users experienced more fevers than 
uh, control group. So we're going to change that to a right-tailed test. So when we compute this, it's going to give us the p-value and the test statistic. So the test statistic right here, 2.1995, which is exactly what we had in our, what we calculated, which was 2.20 using the formula. And the p-value was 0 0.0139. That's exactly what we had in our notes that we found from the table. So StackCrunch is only going to take you this far. You have to know what to do with that p-value. In other words, you still have to finish steps 6 and 7 um, by evaluating that the p-value is less than alpha, and what are you going to do with that? So StackRunch does not give you the answer. It only takes you to step 5, which is the p-value. So now let's go ahead to the next question. The next question we did was a confidence interval of men and women and whether there was a difference in how many tattoos they had. So again, this was a proportion stats using two samples. And, and whoops, let's try that again. Proportion stats with two samples. And we have the summary. So again, we're going to put in the information. We used men for group one. And there was 181 out of 1205 of men that have at least one tattoo. And for the women, there was 143 out of the 1097. So this time we're going to conduct a confidence interval. And we're doing that at the 0.95 uh, confidence level. So when we compute that, it's going to give us the lower and the upper bounds here. You can see negative 0.008. 0.085, which is exactly what we have. We rounded up to 0 0.009. And the upper limit of 0 0.048, which is exactly, again, what we had using the formulas. OK, so now I'm back to the lecture notes, finishing out this section. We already did uh, testing uh, two different proportions from two independent samples. But now we're going to test proportions of two dependent samples. We're going to use what's called McNamara's test. So to test the hypothesis, we use this uh, matrix or table view uh, to test whether two population proportions where samples are dependent arrange the data in what's called a contingency table. And we'll be using these contingency tables through chapter 12 as well. Notice McNamara's test is not in StackCrunch. So we can use the steps that follow, provided that, again, the samples are dependent and they're obtained randomly. And the total number of observations where the outcomes differ must be greater than or equal to 10. Then we determine the null and the alternate hypothesis, just like we did uh, with the previous examples. The null and the alternate hypothesis is going to uh, look like this. You're going to state that the first proportion is equal to the second pro population proportion. And your alternate is simply that they are just not equal to each other. So we're not doing a, a left or a right test. We're only simply stating a two-tailed test of not equal to. Then we state our level of significance. We compute our test statistic, which our Z is calculated a completely different way than we're used to calculating. These values come from your matrix table up above. In the matrix table up above, you're going to have treatment A and treatment B, which is given to one particular individual. And whether or not they received success or failure from each of those treatments. So you're going to have four numbers in this table. And if you're familiar with matrices, these little subscripts rep uh, represent where they're located in the table. For example, F11 is uh, the data point that is located in the first row, first column. F12 is the data point listed in the first row, second column. F21 is the data point listed in the second row, first column. And this last one is the data point listed in the second row, second column. So down here, when we're calculating the test statistic, we're only using F12 and F21 in our calculation. 
So F12 and F21 are the only values that are used in Z. We don't use the other two. So we're only looking at the ones that are where one treatment is a success and the other is a failure, or this treatment is a success and the other is a failure. We're not worried about the both successes or both being failures. So once we find our test statistic, we then go to table five to determine the p-value and then we make our conclusion. So those are our seven steps. So now we're ready to do an example. So in a survey of 3,029 um, adult Americans, the Harris Polk asked people whether they smoked cigarettes and whether they always wear a seatbelt in the car. The table shows the results of the survey. For each activity, we define a success as finding an individual who, who participates in that hazardous activity. So at first glance, you would ask yourself, do you think those that don't wear a seatbelt will be of the same group of not wearing a seat, uh, uh, of not smoking, or of smoking, excuse me. So the hazardous activity would be smoking and not wearing a seatbelt. So do you think the people in those two, those groups will be of similar proportions? In other words, the same people that aren't wearing seatbelts are the same people that smoke, basically is what they're asking. So it's one person, two characteristics. That's why it's a dependent sample. So again, why is this a dependent sample? Because the same person is being asked two questions. And my two answers are going to be paired together. So both answers are paired together. It does not make any sense to compare whether or not I wear a seatbelt to whether or not Bob smokes. We want to compare one person's characteristics and, and um, habitual behaviors with themselves, not with somebody else. So we're going to conduct a hypothesis test and we're going to try to determine whether there is a significant difference in the proportion of individuals who smoke and a significant proportion of individuals who do not wear a seatbelt. In other words, those are the same hazardous activity. In other words, is there a significant difference between the population of individuals who engage in these hazardous activities? And we're going to test this at the 0.05 level of significance. We'll use the seven step method by hand, and then I'll show you how to do it in StackCrunch. All right, so the seven steps are, first, we meet the requirements. So remember, there are three got to make sure that our sample is coming from a random sample. So in the description of the problem, it should state that each um, person was chosen from a random sample. And if it doesn't say random anywhere in the problem, and then we'll just have to assume that that is true. Then we also have to make sure that the sample is independent. In other words, it's independent from the population. Is how many people I surveyed less than 5% of all adult Americans? And yes, it certainly is. So these results are dependent on each other, but as a whole, these individuals are independent of the population. Also, we have to make sure that the total number of observations, so all of these observations where the outcomes differ is greater than 10. And that will generally also be true. Okay? Okay, so now after we've met the requirements, now we're going to do step two, which if you recall, that is uh, creating our null and our alternate hypothesis. So step two is creating our null hypothesis. We're stating that the two proportions are equal to each other. 
In other words, the proportion of those that don't wear a seatbelt is equal to the proportion of those who smoke. We are stating that that's simply not true. That's just absurd that one hazardous activity would lead you into doing the second hazardous activity. We're going to test that at the 0.05 level of significance and then we calculate our test statistic. Recall your test statistic from the previous page is calculating uh, by using the numbers from the table. Oop, I got there's a minus one up here. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to find F12, which is first row, second column. So we go up to my table and we find the number that's in the first row, second column, which is 448. In other words, they smoke, but they fail, meaning they do wear their seatbelt. So 67 would be, or excuse me, 448 would be my F12. Then we also need F21, which is the second row first column. So those that don't wear a seatbelt, in other words, hazardous activity, but they don't partake in the hazardous activity of the other kind. So we're going to be using 448 and 327 for our values in our test statistic. So we have 448 minus 327. And notice these are in absolute value brackets. We always want to have the positive version of the difference of the two. So it doesn't matter which one you put in first technically because we're always going to take the positive version of that. And then we subtract one because that's how many degrees of freedom we have, which I talked about in previous chapters. And then we divide that by the square root of the sum of those two values. And when we put that into our calculator, I'm going to get a z value of 4.31. Again, always try to calculate this on your own by pausing the video and making sure you get the same values that I did. Then we go to, since it's a Z value, we go to table five and we look up the P value from table five. So let me get my table. Table five we have here and we're looking up a Z value of 4.31. And you're going to notice that 4.31 is off the charts. So it's going to be even greater than this last number right here. But of course, that's going to be the right hand side. So we would do 1 minus that number. So 1 minus 0.9998, which is 0 0.0002. Now also recall that this is a two tailed test. So that means we have to multiply this by 2 because this is only the right-hand tail. We also have a left-hand tail. So my total p-value is going to be 0 0.0004. It's actually going to be smaller than that because we were off the table. But this is small enough to be able to make our conclusion. Our conclusion is that our p-value, even though it's smaller than that, is certainly less than our alpha, which means we are going to reject the null hypothesis, which means we can now conclude that there is a difference between the two populations. So I would state as an interpretation here, I would say there is sufficient evidence at the 0 0.05 level of significance to conclude that there is a difference in the proportion of people who don't smoke or don't wear seatbelt, excuse me, that's the hazardous activity, 
and those who smoke. Ran out of room there. So there is sufficient evidence at the 0.05 level of significance to conclude that there is a difference in the proportion of people who don't wear a seatbelt and those who smoke. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do in estimating proportions from this first section is to calculate the sample size that is needed uh, to determine, to estimate the difference between two proportions. And in order to decide what the sample size needs to be, we have two different equations. The first one is if you have previous estimates for p hat. And the second one is if you have no previous estimates for p hat. If you have no previous estimates, this n will always be larger than this n where you have previous history, okay, because you have more information. So let's go through the bottom and use an example of each of those. And then I'll go back to Stackrutch and show you both of these answers as well. Remember the previous test, McNamara's, we weren't able to do in Stackrutch. Okay, so we have an example that says a physical therapist wants to determine the difference in the proportion of men and women who participate in regular sustained physical activity. What sample size should be obtained if she wishes to estimate to be within three percentage points with a 95% confidence, assuming that she uses the 1998 estimates of 21.9% men and 19.7% females from the U.S. National Center of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Pr Promotion. Okay, so here we have previous estimates for p hat. We'll again use men as the first group and we'll use females as the second group. So since we have previous estimates, we're going to use this equation up here. And so we're going to use the same sample size for both men and women. They're both going to be equal to each other. So N1 and N2 will both be the same size, and that's going to be equal to, trying to get both on one screen here, uh, we're going to have P1 hat, which is 21.9%, so we'll write that as a decimal, times 1 minus that value, plus P2 hat, which is the females, times 1 minus that, so all of that is in brackets. And then we multiply that by Z of alpha over 2 over E squared. So Z of alpha over 2 comes from your confidence level. So we want to be 95% confident. So again, we go to our table in the bottom left-hand corner. They're already given to you. And for 95% confidence, we're using a critical Z value of 1.96. And under here, we're going to put the standard error or what you want your margin of error to be. And we want to be within three percentage points. So that's going to be my E. But of course, we're going to write that as a decimal, not as a percent. So we're going to put that as 0.03. So when we put all of that in my calculator, you're going to get an N of 1,406 individuals that have to be included in each sample. So both N1 N and N2 have to be of that size or more. Now, I rounded up. You always round up with sample sizes because you want to make sure you have enough individuals to complete the study. We never round down. Even if this was 1405.1, we will always round up for sample size. Now we're going to do one more time. And what if she doesn't have any prior estimates? So we're going to use uh, the second formula here where there's no prior estimates. So again, N1 and N2 will both be of the same size, and we're supposed to use a 
for all of this where you have no p hats, we're simply just going to use 0.5. And then this information over here is the same. And when I put that in my calculator, I get that n has to be 2,035 individuals. Okay, so I flipped my screen around to show you how to um, compute the sample size for two population proportions. We're going to go to stat, down to proportion stats for two sample, and this time we're going to do, uh, we're going to calculate the sample size using a given width. We're given the width, which is a margin of error of 3%, so we're given the width that it needs to be. So what we're going to do he down here is we're going to calculate a 95% confidence interval. Our first uh, P1 hat, which was our men that work out, was 0.219 or 21.9%. There was 19.7% of females that worked out. And then the width is 3% or 0.03. But we have to put in the total width of both sides of a complete margin of error. Remember, we go 0.03 to the right side of the point estimate and also 0.03 to the left side of the point estimate. So total width is going to be 6%. And we calculate to find the sample size, which is 1,406. Now for the second one, we didn't have a prior estimate. So the question is, what do we put in over here? Well, we're going to put in the most basic proportion, which is 50%. So we're going to put in 50% here for both and compute that. And you're going to find that you're going to need, oh, we got to put 6% over here. And then when we calculate, you can see that we need 2,035 people in our, each of our samples to be able to calculate this.